Okay, so welcome to this next video on uh, P53 and the response to DNA damage. Okay, so so far what we've seen is that if the DNA gets damaged in some way, then uh, the cell activates the P53 protein, and the P53 protein tetramizes, uh, translocates into the nucleus, and uh, is then going to uh, activate the expression of a whole bunch of genes. And the genes that it's going to activate the expression of are firstly involved in DNA repair. So uh, we want to try and repair uh, the uh, damage that has occurred to the DNA. Secondly, it's going to increase the expression of this P21 protein, which arrests the cell cycle. And we're going to discuss in this video in more detail how it arrests the cell cycle. And uh, thirdly, if you have P53 levels at a very high level uh, for sustained periods of time, then what it starts to do is it starts to increase the expression of pro-apoptotic proteins, which are going to drive the cell to commit suicide, basically. So if the DNA damage is so bad that it's just the DNA repair mechanisms are not working, uh, then P53 levels will be high for an extended period of time, and that will start uh, causing the cell to commit suicide, basically, because it's not going to get better if it's um, if it, if it's if the DNA repair mechanisms have failed to uh, uh, heal the damage. Okay, so in this video what I want to talk about is more about how P21 blocks the progression through the cell cycle. And in order to do that, we need to discuss more about uh, the cell cycle and what happens at each stage. So, the cell cycle then. So, um, if we have a single cell here, then the cell cycle pretty much is the process by which this cell can go from being a single cell to being two cells. So the process of this cell dividing in two, basically. Okay, right. Uh, so um, the cell cycle consists of five phases, roughly. Uh, the first is a phase known as interphase. Now, in interphase, it's not really part of the cell cycle. Um, it's um, it's the portion where the cell is not actually dividing at all. So once the cell has been formed by the division of a father cell, uh, then um, it starts its life, and it, that's the start of interphase, basically. And until that cell itself s decides that it would like to divide, then uh, it remains in interphase. So it remains in interphase all of that time, basically, until it decides to divide. So basically, interphase is just a period of quiescence where you are not dividing. Okay, you are just doing your normal uh, cellular functions. Now, when a cell receives certain growth stimulatory signals, then it can decide that it wants to begin the process of division. And the first phase of the active cell cycle is what's known as the G1 phase. Uh, for the first growth phase. So this is the first growth phase of the cell cycle. Okay? And um, if you um, want to stimulate a cell to move from interphase into the first growth phase, then there are a number of different stimulatory pathways uh, that you can use. So examples of pathways which can stimulate this are uh, the Wnt beta catenin pathway. Okay, so Wnt um, signaling to the cell is going to activate the frizzled receptor. That's going to then activate disheveled, which is going to inactivate the beta-catenin destruction complex. And that will lead to beta-catenin levels in the cytoplasm of the cell going up. Okay, so the Wnt beta catenin pathway is a way in which you can uh, activate uh, the movement from interphase to the first growth phase. And another uh, example is the growth factor receptor pathways. Okay, so growth factor receptor pathways. Uh, so uh, growth factors can bind to their growth factor receptors, and then the growth factor receptors can recruit pathways um, which are pro um, pro um, pro-growth, basically, pro-cell cycle. Um, and there are two major pathways that growth factors, and well, there are more than two, but the two major pathways which growth factor receptors can um, activate are the MAP kinase ERK pathway and um, the PI3 kinase, protein kinase B, mTOR pathway. 
perfectly okay. What these pathways do, though, is they uh, increase the transcription of, um, of loads of genes associated with the growth of the cell. So, uh, what sort of genes are you going to get the incre increased expression of? Well, if you think about it, if this cell is going to divide into two, then um, it's going to have to double the amount of protein it has because all of the essential proteins for the metabolism within the cell, those are all going to have to be copied, basically. They're all going to have to be duplicated because each of the daughter cells is going to need a copy of those proteins. So that's firstly one of the things that is um, going to have to be done in the first growth phase. You're going to have to increase the expression of loads of these sort of basic proteins for cell uh, metabolism and all of the receptors and things that are in the membrane as well. In addition, you're going to have to start making the proteins that are associated uh, with DNA replication. So, in order to divide, what has to happen is you have to copy all of the genomic information so that each new cell will have a copy of that genomic information. And in G1 phase, basically, you get ready um, to um, rep... Well, you get ready to... Um, to um, to begin the replication of the genetic material. Okay, now what do I specifically mean by getting ready uh, to replicate the DNA ma genetic material? Well, uh, the way in which a chromosome is, um, is replicated, so if I draw a chromosome here, let's say this is a chromosome, then uh, basically the way in which chromosomes are copied is that you have multiple origins of replication all the way along the chromosome, okay? And you might think that, well, a way of copying the DNA would simply be to have one DNA polymerase starting at one end of the chromosome and basically making its way from one side to the other and then synthesizing complementary strands to the two initial strands of DNA. That is not what is done because it takes too long. Instead, what you have is multiple origins of replication along the chromosome. So these are origins of replication. Okay, and these are all sites from which um, from which DNA polymerases can begin. So a DNA polymerase can bind here and then uh, begin the process of copying the DNA, basically. So it can make its way along here and copy the DNA. Okay, um, so um, it will, uh, if the DNA polymerase that binds to this first origin of replication, basically, it will synthesize the two new strands, which are complementary to these two original strands, but it will only do it between the first origin of replication and the second origin of replication. So let me color code the strands in order to make it more obvious. So these are the two original strands here now, and what I'm drawing in orange are the two new strands that you've synthesized to be complementary to the two original strands. Okay, and the DNA polymerase acting from this first origin of replication will only work as far as the second origin of replication. And then simultaneously to the first DNA polymerase acting from the first origin of replication, you'll also put in a DNA polymerase enzyme acting on the second origin of replication, and it basically will then synthesize the complementary strands to these uh, two original strands in the region between this second origin of replication and this third origin of replication. Okay, so basically, instead of just having one DNA polymerase starting at one end and making its way along the entire strand, instead you have multiple DNA polymerases all starting at these different origins of replication, and they all just have to copy the DNA between their origin of replication and the next origin of replication. So the DNA polymerase that binds here will work that way, the DNA polymerase that will bind here will also work that way, so they all work in the same direction, and in that way, they're going to copy the entire chromosome, and that will take much less time, basically, because you've got multiple DNA polymerases working simultaneously. Okay, now, uh, the DNA polymerase enzymes uh, cannot just uh, bind to these origins of replication. Uh, instead, what you have to do is you have to assemble huge, great protein complexes on the origins of replication in order to get the DNA polymerase to actually bind. Now, 
in growth, in the first growth phase, you don't quite synthesize the final protein complexes that you need in order for DNA polymerase to bind. Instead, what you synthesize are what are known as pre-replication complexes, okay? And basically, these pre-replication complexes will be modified in, um, in the S phase of the cell cycle. So later on, they'll be modified in order to actually make them ready for the DNA polymerase to uh, bind. So you're just setting up the uh, initial portion, basically, and they'll be modified later on. Uh, because if you set up the whole thing now, then the DNA polymerase could just go and bind, and then you uh, would have started the replication of the DNA in G1 phase. So you only make up, uh, you make up a, um, a complex that isn't actually capable of DNA polymerase yet binding. So, um, you can't with what you put with what you assemble in the G1 phase you can't actually begin replication and it requires modifications that happen in S phase to then allow the DNA polymerase to bind and then start replicating so in G1 phase you get ready by making these pre-replication complexes okay now you then move into uh, what's known as the S phase of the cell cycle so this is the phase where you actually synthesize the DNA. So it stands for synthesis phase because you're actually going to replicate the DNA in this phase. So uh, let me color this in pink. Okay, so in pink we have the S phase of the cell cycle. And uh, in the S phase, the origins of replicate, uh, sorry, these complexes on the origins of replication are going to be modified slightly to make them actually functional and then the DNA polymerase combined and then you'll get the replication of the DNA. Okay, um, right, so now let's discuss, we've, we're in a position now to discuss um, the um, role of some of these cycle independent kinases basically. So, um, we, um, in fact, actually, maybe I'll, maybe I'll um, discuss the whole cell cycle, complete the whole cell cycle, and then discuss the cycling, cycle independent kinases. Yeah, that seems like a more logical way of doing it. So, uh, let's next, uh, the next phase of the cell cycle is what's known as the G2 phase. Okay, so, so far, what has happened is you have replicated the DNA in your cell, and also in the G1 phase, you've started to uh, duplicate proteins that you're going to need uh, in the two daughter cells. In the G2 phase, you continue this work, basically. So you're going to continue the duplication of proteins that are going to be necessary for both daughter cells to have, but also uh, you're going to start synthesizing proteins that are associated with the actual uh, division of the nucleus, because at the moment what you've got is you've got a nucleus with twice the amount of genetic information in. So in this single nucleus, uh, every single piece of DNA, every single chromosome, all 46 of the chromosomes, has copied itself. So you've got absolute replicas of each one. So you've now got 92 chromosomes in here. Okay, uh, so uh, you're going to firstly need to split the nucleus in two so that you have two genetically identical nuclei, and then you're going to have to split the cell in two, where one of these nuclei goes into each of the um, two daughter cells. So, to prepare for that um, process of splitting the nucleus in two, the, uh, which is known as mitosis, and then splitting the um, cell in two, which is known as cytokinesis, uh, you need a lot of proteins, and those are going to be synthesized in this second growth or second gap phase. Then finally, there's the M phase of mitosis, and this is the phase where firstly you divide the nucleus, so it consists of mitosis here, which is strictly the division of the nucleus, although people often use it to describe the division of the cell. Cytokinesis is the uh, strict word for the cell splitting in two. So in mitosis, what is going to happen is you're going to go from having one nucleus with twice the number of chromosomes in um, to having two nuclei, each with the uh, single um, copy of each chromosome, so each with 46 chromosomes in. Of course, they will have the homologous chromosomes. Do not confuse that. When I say a single copy of each chromosome, I mean that it no longer has a replica of every single one of the 46 chromosomes. It will still have two chromosome 1s, uh, two chromosome 2s, etc. 
So they will still have the two homologous chromosomes. Right, uh, but homologous chromosomes aren't identical replicas. They just have to happen to have the same genes. Okay, and then finally, in cytokinesis, what will happen is the cell will actually split in two. So here comes the cell splitting in two, and one of these nuclei will go into each of the cells. So that's the process of cytokinesis. So let's just colour in those final steps of the cell cycle. So we'll have in um, red, we'll have mitosis. And then in yellow, we'll have uh, cytokinesis here. OK, right. So basically, uh, cyclin-dependent kinases, then, we need to discuss how they're important in the cell cycle. But I think we'll do that in the next video.